The Attributes of Summer. So there you have it. You're well aware of exactly what was coming to Himmel Street by the end of 1940. I know, you know. Liesl Memminger, however, cannot be put into that category. For The Book Thief, the summer of that year was simple. It consisted of four main elements or attributes. At times, she would wonder which was the most powerful. And the nominees are advancing through the shoulder shrug every night, reading on the floor of the mayor's library, playing soccer on Himmel Street, the seizure of a different stealing opportunity. The shoulder shrug, she decided, was excellent. Each night when she calmed herself from her nightmare, she was soon pleased that she was awake and able to read. A few pages, Papa asked her, and Liesl, Liesl would nod. Sometimes they would complete a chapter the next afternoon down in the basement. The authorities' problem with the book was obvious. The protagonist was a Jew, and he was presented in a positive light. Unforgivable. He was a rich man who was tired of letting life pass him by, what he referred to as the shrugging of the shoulders to the problems and pleasures of a person's time on earth. In the early part of summer in mulching, as Liesl and Papa made their way through the book, this man was traveling to Amsterdam on business, and the snow was shivering outside. The girl loved that, the shivering snow. That's exactly what it does when it comes down, she told Hans Huberman. They sat together on the bed, Papa half asleep and the girl wide awake. Sometimes she watched Papa as he slept, knowing both more and less about him than either of them realized. She often heard him and Mama discussing his lack of work or talking despondently about Hans going to see their son, only to discover that the young man had left his lodging and was most likely already on his way to war. Schlafgut, Papa, the girl sat and said at those times, sleep well, and she slipped around him out of bed to turn off the light. The next attribute, as I've mentioned, was the mayor's library. To exemplify that particular situation, we can look to a cool day in late June. Rudy, to put it mildly, was incensed. Who did Liesl Memminger think she was, telling him she had to take the wash she had to take the washing and ironing alone today? Wasn't he good enough to walk the streets with her? Stop complaining, Sakurl, she reprimanded him. I just feel bad. You're missing the game. He looked over his shoulder. Well, if you put it that way, there was a schm schmunzel. You can stick your washing. He ran off and wasted no time joining a team. When Liesl made it to the shop of Himmel Street, she looked back just in time to see how, him standing in front of the nearest makeshift goals. He was waving. Suck, girl, she laughed. And as she held her hand, she knew completely that he was simultaneously calling her a saw mensch. I think that's as close to love as 11-year-olds can get. She started to run to Grand Strasse in the mayor's house. Certainly there was sweat and the wrinkled pants of, of breath stretching out in front of her, but she was reading. The mayor's wife, having let the girl in for the fourth time, was sitting at the desk simply watching the books. On the second visit, she had given permission for Liesl to put one, one out and go through it, which led to another and another up until up, until up to half a dozen books were stuck to her, either clutched beneath her arm or among the pile that was climbing higher in her remaining hand. On this occasion, as Liesl stood in the cool surrounds of the room, her stomach growled, but no reaction was forthcoming from the mute, damaged woman. She was in her bathrobe again, and although she observed the girl several times, it was never for very long. She usually paid more attention to what was next to her, to something missing. The window was opened wide, a square, cool mouth with occasional gusty surges. Liesl sat on the floor. The books were scattered around her. After 40 minutes, she left. Every title was returned to its place. Goodbye, Froy Herman. The words always came out. It came as a shock. Thank you. After which the woman said her woman paid her and she left. Every movement was accounted for and the book thief ran home. As summer set in, the room full of books became warmer and with every pickup or delivery day, the floor was not as painful. Liesl would sit with a small pile of books next to her and she'd read a few paragraphs of each, trying to memorize the words she didn't know to ask Papa when she made it home. Later on, as an adolescent, when Liesl wrote about these books, she no longer remembered the titles, not one. Perhaps had, the, had she stolen them, she would have been better equipped. What she did remember was that one of the picture books had a, had a name written clumsily on the inside cover. The name of a boy, Johann Hermann. Liesl bit down on her lip, but she could not resist it for long. From the floor, she turned and looked up at the bathrobed woman and made an inquiry. Johann Hermann, she said. Who's that? The woman looked at, beside her, somewhere next to the girl's knees. Liesl apologized. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be asking such things. She let the sentence die at its own death. The woman's face did not alter, yet somehow she managed to speak. He is nothing now in this world, she explained. 
He was my, the files of recollection. Oh yes, I definitely remember him. The sky was murky and deep like quicksand. There was a young man parceled up in barbed wire like a giant crown of thorns. I untangled him and carried him out. High above the earth, we sank together to our knees. It was just another day, 1918. Apart from everything else, she said, he froze to death. For a moment, she played with her hands and she said it again. He froze to death, I'm sure of it. The mayor's wife was just one of a worldwide brigade. You have seen her before, I'm certain. In your stories, your poems, the screens you like to watch. They're everywhere, so why not here? Why not on a shapely hill in a small German town? It's as good a place to suffer as any. The point is, Ilsa Herman had decided to make suffering her triumph. When it refused to let go of her, she succumbed to it. She embraced it. She could have shot herself, scratched herself, or indulged in other forms of self-mutilation, but she chose what she probably felt was the weakest option, to at least endure the discomfort of the weather. For all Liesel knew, she prayed for summer days they, that were cold and wet. For the most part, she lived in the right place. When Liesel left that day, she said something with great uneasiness. In translation, two giant words were struggled with, carried on her shoulder, and dropped as a bung bungling pair at Ilsa Herman's feet. They fell off sideways as the girl veered with them and could no longer sustain their weight. Together, they sat on the floor, large and loud and clumsy. Two giant words. I'm sorry. Again, the mayor's wife watched the space next to her, a blank page face. For what? she asked, but time had elapsed by then. The girl was already well out of the room. She was nearly at the front door. When she heard it, Liesel stopped, but she chose not to go back, preferring to make her way noiselessly from the house and down the steps. She took in the view of the mulching before disappearing down into it, and she pitied the mayor's wife for quite a while. At times, Liesel wondered if she should simply leave the woman alone. But Ilsa Herman was too interesting, and the pull of the books was too strong. Once, words had rendered Liesel useless, but now when she sat on the floor with the mayor's wife at her husband's desk, she felt an innate sense of power. It happened every time she deciphered a new word or pieced together a sentence. She was a girl in Nazi Germany. How fitting that she was discovering the power of words, and how awful and yet exhilarating it would feel many months later when she would unleash this power of this the power of this newfound discovery the very moment the mayor's wife let her down. How quickly the pity would leave her and how quickly it would spill over into something else completely. Now though, in the summer of 1940, she could not see what lay ahead in more ways than one. She was witness only to a sorrowful woman with a room full of books whom she enjoyed visiting. That was all. It was part two of her existence that summer. Part three, thank God, was a little more lighthearted. Himmel Street Soccer. Allow me to play you a picture. Feet scuffing road, the rush of boyish breath, shouted words. Here, this way, shice, the coarse bounce of ball on road. All were present on Himmel Street, as well as the sound of apologies, as summer further intensified. The apologies belonged to Liesel Memminger. They were directed at Tommy Mueller. By the start of July, she finally managed to convince him that she wasn't going to kill him. Since the beating she'd handed him the previous November, Tommy was still frightened to be around her. In the soccer meetings on Himmel Street, he kept well clear. You never know when she might snap. He'd confided in Rudy, half twitching, half speaking. In Liesel's defense, she never gave up on trying to put him at ease. It disappointed her that she'd successfully made peace with Ludwig Schmeichel and not, and not with the innocent Tommy Mueller. He still cowered slightly whenever he saw her. How could I know you were smiling for me that day? She asked him repeatedly. She'd even put in a few stints as a goalie for him until, until everyone else on the team begged him to go back in. Get back in there, a boy named Harald Mollenhauer finally ordered him. You're useless. This was after Tommy tripped him as, as he was about to score. He would have awarded himself a penalty, but for the fact that they were on the same side. Liesel came back out and would somehow, uh, somehow always end up opposing Rudy. They would tackle and trip each other, call each other names. Rudy would commentate. She can't get around him this time, the stupid salmon jog grobble, grobbler. She hasn't got a hope. He seemed to enjoy calling Liesel an ass scratcher. It was one of the joys of childhood. Another of the joys, of course, was stealing. Part four, summer 1940. In fairness, there were many things that brought Rudy and Liesel together, but it was the stealing that cemented their friendship completely. It was brought about by one opportunity, and it was driven by one inescapable force, Rudy's hunger. The boy was permanently dying for something to eat. 
On top of the rationing situation, his father's business wasn't doing as well so well of late. The threat of Jewish competition was taken away, but so were the Jewish customers. The Steiners were scratching things together to get by. Like many other people on the Himmel Street side of town, they needed to trade. Liesel would have given him some food from her place, but there wasn't, wasn't an abundance of it there either. Mama usually made pea soup. On Sundays, a Sunday night, she cooked it, and just and not just enough for one or two repeat performances. She made enough pea soup to last until the following Saturday. Then on Sunday, she'd cook another one. Pea soup, bread, sometimes a small portion of potatoes or meat. You ate it up, and you didn't ask for more, and you didn't complain. At first, they did things to try to forget about it. Rudy wouldn't be hungry if they played, played soccer on the street, or if they took bikes from his br brother and sister and rode to Alex Steiner's shop or visited Liesel's papa if he was working that particular day. Hans Huberman would sit with them and tell jokes in the last light of, of afternoon. With the arrival of a few hot days, another distraction was lean, learning to swim in the Amper River. The water was still a little too cold, but they went anyway. Come on, Rudy coaxed her in. Just here. It isn't so deep here. She couldn't see the giant hole she was t walking into and sank straight to the bottom. Dog paddling saved her life, despite nearly choking on the swollen intake of water. You saw Curl, she accused him when she collapsed onto the riverbank. Rudy made certain to keep well away. He'd seen what she did to Ludwig Schmeichel. You can swim now, can't you? Which didn't particularly cheer her up as she marched away. Her hair was pa pasted to the side of her face and snot was flowing from her nose. He called after her. Does this mean I don't get a kiss for teaching you? Suck curl! The nerve of him! It was inevitable. The depressing pea soup and Rudy's hunger finally drove them to thievery. It inspired their attachment to an older group of kids who, who stole from the farmers, fruit stealers. After a game of soccer, both Liesel and Rudy learned the benefits of keeping their eyes open. Sitting on Rudy's front step, they noticed Fritz Hammer, one of their older counterparts, eating an apple. It was one of the Clar variety, ripening in July and August, and it looked magnificent in his hand. Three or four more of them clearly bulged in his jacket pockets. They wandered closer. Where did you get those? Rudy asked. The boy only grinned at first. Shh, and he stopped. He then proceeded to pull an apple from his pocket and toss it over. Just look at it, he warned them. Don't eat it. The next time they saw the same boy wearing the same jacket on a day that was too warm for it, they followed him. He led them toward the up upstream section of the Amper River. It was close to where Liesel sometimes read with her papa when she was first learning. A group of five boys, some lanky, a few short and lean, stood waiting. There were a few such groups in mulching at the time, some with members as young as six. The leader of the particular outfit was an agreeable 15-year-old criminal named Arthur Berg. He looked around and saw the two 11-year-olds dangling off the back. Und? he asked. And? I'm starving, Rudy replied. And he's fast, said Liesel. Berg looked at her. I don't recall asking for your opinion. He was teenage tall and had a long neck. Pimples were gathered in peer groups on his face. But I like you. He was friendly in a smart-mouthed adolescent way. Isn't this the one who beat up your brother, Anderl? Word had certainly made its way around. A good hiding transcends the divides of age. Another boy, one of the short, lean ones with shaggy blonde hair and ice-colored skin, looked over. I think so, Rudy confirmed it. It is. Andy Schmeichel walked across and studied her, up and down, his face pensive before breaking into a gaping smile. Great work, kid. He even slapped her among the bones of her back, catching a sharp piece of shoulder blade. I'd get whipped for it if I did it myself. Arthur had moved on to Rudy, and you're the Jesse Owens one, aren't you? Rudy nodded. Clearly, said Arthur, you're an idiot, but you're our, our kind of idiot. Come on. They were in. When they reached the farm, Liesel and Rudy were, thro were thrown a sack. Arthur Berg gripped his own burlap bag. He ran a hand through his mild strands of hair. Either of you ever stolen before? Of course, Rudy certified. All the time. It was not very convincing. Liesel was more specific. I've stolen two books, at which Arthur laughed in three short snorts. His pimples shifted position. You can't eat books, sweetheart. From there, they all examined the apple trees, who stood in long, twisted rows. Arthur Burr gave the orders. One, he said, don't get caught on the fence. You get caught on the fence, you will get left behind. Understood? Everyone nodded or, or said yes. Two, one in the tree, one below. Someone has to collect. He rubbed his hands together. He was enjoying this. Three, if you see someone coming, you call out loud enough to wake the dead and we all run. Rick Tig? Rick Tig. It was a chorus. Two deputant, deputant apple thieves whispering. Liesel, are you sure? Do you still want to do this? Look at the barbed wire, Rudy. It's so high. No, no, look, you throw the sack on, see? Like them. All right. Come on, then. 
I can't. Hesitation. Rudy, I move it, Samench. He pushed her toward the fence, threw the empty sack on the, on the wire, and they climbed over, running toward the others. Rudy made his way up the closest tree and started flinging down the apples. Liesel stood below, putting them into the sack. By the time it was full, there was another problem. How do we get back over the fence? The answer came when they noticed Arthur Bird climbing as close to a fence post as possible. The wire is stronger there, Rudy pointed. He threw the sack over, made Liesel go first, then landed beside her on the other side, among the fruit that spilled from the bag. Next to them, the long legs of Arthur Berg stood, stood watching in amusement. Not bad, landed the voice from above. Not bad at all. When they made it back to the river, hidden among the trees, he took the sack and gave Liesel and Rudy a dozen apples between them. Good work, was his final comment on the matter. That afternoon before they returned home, Liesel and Rudy consumed six apples apiece within half an hour. At first, they entertained thoughts of sharing the fruit at their respective homes, but there, were considerable, there was considerable danger in that. They didn't particularly relish the opportunity of explaining just where the fruit had come from. Liesel even thought that perhaps she could get away with only telling Papa, but she didn't want him thinking that she had a compulsive criminal on his hands, so she ate it. On the riverbank where she learned to swim, each apple was disposed of. Unaccustomed to such luxury, they knew it was likely they'd be sick. They ate anyway. Samench, Mama abused her that night. Why are you vomiting so much? Maybe it's the pea soup, Liesel suggested. That's right, Papa echoed. He was over at the window again. It must be. I feel a bit sick myself. Who are you, Sakurl? Quickly, she turned back to face the vomiting Samench. Well, what is it? What is it, you filthy pig? But Liesel, she said nothing. The apples, she thought happily. The apples. And she vomited one more time for luck. The Aryan Shopkeeper. They stood outside Freud Diller's against the whitewashed wall. A piece of candy was in Liesel Memminger's mouth. The sun was in her eyes. Despite these difficulties, she was still able to speak and argue. Another conversation between Rudy and Liesel. Hurry up, Samanch. That's ten already. It's not. It's only eight. I've got two, two to go. Well, hurry up then. I told you we should have t gotten a knife and sawed it in half. Come on, that's two. All right, here, and don't swallow it. Do I look like an idiot? A short pause. This is great, isn't it? It sure is, Samanch. At the end of August and summer, they found one fennig, uh, fennig on the ground, pure excitement. It was sitting half rotten in some dirt on the washing and ironing route, a solitary corroded coin. Take a look at that! Rudy swooped on it. The excitement almost uh, almost stung as they rushed back to Froy Dillers, not even considering that a single fennig might be, not be the right price. They burst through the door and stood in front of the Aryan shopkeeper, who regarded them with contempt. I'm waiting, she said. Her hair was tied back and her black dress choked her body. The framed photo of the Freuer kept watching, the wa watching from the wall. Heil Hitler, Rudy led. Heil Hitler, she responded, straightening taller behind the counter. And you? She glared at Liesel, who promptly gave her a Heil Hitler of her own. It didn't take Rudy long to dig the coin from his pocket and place it firmly on the counter. He looked straight into Freuer, Freuer Dill Diller's spectac spectacled eyes and said, Mix candy, please. Froy Diller smiled. Her teeth, her teeth elbowed each other for room in her mouth, and her unexpected kindness made Rudy and Liesel smile as well. Not for long. She bent down, did some searching, and came back. Here, she said, tossing a single piece of candy onto the counter. Mix it yourself. Outside, they unwrapped it and tried biting it in half, but the sugar was like glass. Far too tough, even for Rudy's animal-like chompers. Instead, they had to trade trade sucks on it until it was finished. Ten sucks for Rudy, ten for Liesel, back and forth. This, Rudy announced at one point with a candy-toothed grin, is the good life, and Liesel didn't disagree. By the time they were finished, both their mouths were an exaggerated red, and as they walked home, they reminded each other to keep their, to keep each other, they reminded each other to keep their eyes peeled in case they found another coin. Naturally, they found nothing. No one can be that lucky twice in one year, let alone a single afternoon. Still, with red tongues and teeth, they walked down Himmel Street, happily searching the ground as they went. The day had been a great one, and Nazi Germany was a wondrous place. The struggler continued. We move forward now to a cold night struggle. We'll let the book thief catch up later. It was November 3rd, and the floor of the train held on onto his feet. In front of him, he read from the copy of Mein Kampf. His savior, sweat was swimming out of his hands. Finger marks clutched the book. Book Thief Productions officially presents Mein Kampf, My Struggle by Adolf Hitler. Behind Max Vandenberg, the city of Stuttgart opened its arms in mockery. He was not welcome there, and he tried not to look back as, he, as the stale bread dis disintegrated in his stomach. 
A few times, he shifted again and watched the lights become only a handful and then disappear altogether. Look proud, he advised himself. You cannot look afraid. Read the book. Smile at it. It's a great book. The greatest book you've ever read. Ignore that woman on the other side. She's asleep now anyway. Come on, Max. You're only a few hours away. As it had turned out, the promise return visit in the room of darkness didn't take days. It had taken a week and a half, then another week till the next, and another, until he lost all sense of the passing of days and hours. He was relocated once more to another small storage room where there was more light, more visits, and more food. Time, however, was running out. I'm leaving soon, his friend Walter Kugler to told him. You know how it is. The army. I'm sorry, Walter. Walter Kugler, Max's friend from childhood, placed his hand on the Jew's shoulder. It could be worse. He looked his friend in his Jewish eyes. I could be you. That was their last meeting. A final package was left in the corner, and this time there was a ticket. Walter opened Mein Kampf and slid it inside, next to the map he'd brought with the book itself. Page 13, he smiled. For luck, yes? For luck. And the two of them embraced. When the door shut, Max opened the book and examined the ticket. Stuttgart to Munich to Pacing. It left in two days in the night, just in time to make the last connection. From there, he would walk. The map was already in his head, folded in quarters. The key was still taped to the inside cover. He sat for half an hour before stepping toward the bag and, and opening it. Apart from food, a few other items sat inside. The ec extra contents of Walter Kugler's gift. One small razor, a spoon, the closest thing to a mirror, shaving cream, a pair of scissors. When he left it, the storeroom was empty but for the floor. Goodbye, he whispered. The last thing Max saw was a small mound of hair sitting casually against the wall. Goodbye. With a clean, shaven face and lopsided yet neatly combed hair, he had walked out of that building a new man. In fact, he walked out, out German. He, hang on a second. He was German. Or more to the point, he had been. In his stomach was the electric combination of nourishment and nausea. He walked to the station. He showed his ticket and identity card, and now he sat in a small box compartment of the train, directly in danger spotlight. Papers? That was what he dreaded to hear. It was bad enough when he was stopped on the platform. He knew he could not withstand it twice. The shivering hands, the smell, no, the stench of guilt. He simply couldn't bear it again. Fortunately, they came through early and only asked for the ticket, and now all that was left was a window of small towns, the congregations of lights, and the woman snoring on the other side of the compartment. For most of the journey, he made his way through the book, trying never to look up. The words lolled about in his, in his mouth as he read them. Strangely, as he turned the pages and progressed through the chapters, it was only two words he ever tasted. Mein Kampf, my struggle, the title over and over again. As the train prattled on from one German town to the next, Mein Kampf, of all things to save him.